It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Big news on Tuesday as the Starbucks Corporation and the Starbucks Workers United folks came together and said uh, there might be, there's a constructive path forward. They're going to work toward a labor agreement. Uh, this was the announcement. This was the big announcement that uh, that, that was put out. Uh, quote, Workers United and Starbucks share a commitment to developing a productive relationship in the best interests of Starbucks partners. During mediation, discussions last week over ongoing brand and LP uh, IP litigation, a constructive path forward emerged on the broader issues of the future of organizing and collective bargaining at Starbucks. They go on to say to build on that path, Workers United and Starbucks have agreed to begin discussions on a foundational framework to achieve collective bargaining agreements for represented represented stores and partners, the resolution of litigation between the union and the company, including brand litigation and a fair process for workers to organize. They go on to say, as a fair as a sign of good faith, Starbucks has agreed to provide workers represented by Workers United with credit card tipping and benefits announced by the company in May of 2022. While there is plenty of work ahead, coming together to develop this framework is a significant step forward and a clear demonstration of a shared commitment to working collaboratively and with mutual respect. Um, I have to tell you, I did not think Starbucks would blink. And here you have Starbucks coming forward and saying, you know what? Okay, we're gonna put up the we're gonna put, put up the white flag. Let's sit down and talk. This is a, an incredibly momentous moment. Uh, this is an enormous moment because they were they were hell bent on there being no union. If you listen to Howard Schultz's comments during his congressional testimony, there didn't seem to be any way he was going to back down. Uh, because look, you have these these paternal types who they take it personally that you know I built this company, it's mine. You know you should be grateful to me, and nothing is going to going to sway that. The fact that th this corporation, this big giant corporation, is willing to go this far, huge. And why did this happen? And that's the part. That's the important part. Why did this happen? Not out of the benevolence of the corporation's good heart. No. Not because, oh, it's the right thing. Oh, it's because of the law. No, none of that matters. These big corporations are willing to break the law. They're willing to spend as much money as, as possible to deny workers their rights. The reason this happened is these workers did not back down. They stood together the entire way through. They stood together in solidarity and said, we demand better. We demand to be treated fairly. We demand to earn good wages, benefits, have a say in the workplace. All of that stuff that we talk about. This is because not just the workers step forward, but communities as well. This is what solidarity looks like. And this, you know, I was, I was thinking about this earlier today when the announcement came down. Look, this is what solidarity gets you. This is what people coming together, active collectively for a, a, a purpose. This is what it gets you. You know, this is workers demanding their say. And when they when workers understand that they have power in numbers, good things happen like this. I mean, this is a huge step forward. The fact that there is potentially going to be a contract is enormous. And the thing is, is this started with one one little store in Buffalo, handful of workers in Buffalo, New York in December of 2021. And now you've got what? Some 400 stores already unionized. Last week, another 21 filed for elections. You're talking about more than what, what some 10,000 people who are going to be, who right now have, have won elections. 
this is, well, to steal a Joe Bidenism, this is kind of a big freaking deal. And look, Starbucks is probably tired of taking the beatings in, in, the, public, in the public sphere. Uh, their shareholder meeting was coming up. They were going to have to answer questions about how much money they've spent on union busting. So this seems like the logical, the logical way forward. This seems like the logical thing to do. And it's good for people. Now understand, again, this is what the power of we the people brings us. This behemoth corporation, they didn't want to do this. But you saw college campuses across the country throwing Starbucks out because college kids are going, nope, not going to do it. You saw you know, a shareholder saying, look, you know, disclose how much money you're spending on anti-union uh, activities. And I love the Starbucks. We don't spend any money on anti-union activities. No, really. Oh, I would have loved to have seen the answer to that. But again, this is, and, and I'm going to bring this back to Joe Biden. This is what happens when you have a pro-labor president. This is what happens when you have a pro-worker president. Uh, yes, you get all the organizing and the workers come together, but you also get companies to listen. And I got to tell you, I think this is this is a big, big day. And good on them. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Do you think differently of Starbucks now? Uh, would you be willing to go in? Because I know you had the uh, the, the Red Cup Rebellion. Is this a, is this a moment to go and and reward those those places? I think it is. Going to take a quick break. When we come back, Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing, going to be here to share some thoughts on China going possibly through the back door of Mexico uh, to get into the U.S. auto market. Back after this. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1942. That was the day that Sue Cowan Williams filed a lawsuit for equal pay for black teachers in Little Rock, Arkansas. 86 black teachers worked in the city's segregated school system. They were all members of the Little Rock Classroom Teachers Association. In 1941, the teachers formed a salary adjustment committee to look into pay discrimination. What they found there was a wide gap between black and white salaries. The average white elementary school teacher made $526 a year, while the black teacher earned only $321. White high school teachers brought home $856 a year, while black teachers only made $567. Backed with this research, the committee presented a petition to the school board demanding an end to pay discrimination. The board tabled the petition, and that that summer passed another round of unequal pay raises. The teachers then approached the NAACP and asked them to handle their case. Thurgood Marshall agreed to take up the lawsuit. Marshall would go on to become the first black U.S. Supreme Court justice. Sue Cowan Williams, the head of the English department at Dunbar High School, was selected as the plaintiff for the case. The teachers lost their lawsuit and then won on appeal, but Williams paid a price for her involvement. The next school year, the school district did not renew her contract. She was finally rehired to teach at Dunbar a decade later. But first, the school superintendent called Williams to ask her if she had, quote, learned her lesson. It was a lesson that many workers have learned, that there is often a high personal cost for standing up for justice on the job. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So a new report by the folks at the Alliance for American Manufacturing talking about, um, and we've been talking about this for a long time, uh, the fact that you know there's a transition going on in the auto industry, moving towards EVs, new technology, batteries, all this stuff. Last week, we talked about the CEO of Ford going, hey, maybe we should recreate what we used to have, which is controlling our own supply chain. Wouldn't that be great? Um, but the folks at the Alliance for American Manufacturing have got a new a new report out saying, hey, uh, China's doing some tricky stuff, uh, building some, uh, some potentially building factories in Mexico so they can go into the U.S. market through the back door of Mexico and, well, not have to pay the 25 percent tariffs that are on uh, Chinese vehicles at this moment. And look, you know, companies have been getting away with this. China has been getting away with it for years question is, how do we stop it? Because this could be 
understand this could be the end of the auto industry if if this is allowed to happen that's why i've asked scott paul to come talk with us he's the president of the alliance for american manufacturing the folks who brought us this report scott thanks for taking time for us hey rick great to be with you so walk me through what you, what you guys are talking about as i get from your report um Me- china's looking at mexico to build some some plants maybe slap a license plate on the car ship it across the border there into this market and well offer your know, dirt cheap evs is that what i'm getting yeah yeah that that's the uh that's the gist of it rick and i think that it's it's easy for people not to be concerned about it because they don't see it yet right you don't see chinese automobiles on american roads you don't see the dealerships you don't see anything like that yet and so i think the level of concern uh generally is pretty low uh we want to turn up the temperature temperature a little bit because we know how this turns out and i think that's the issue that we you know we know what has happened with our shipbuilding industry or with our steel and aluminum industries or with you name any high-tech product right not to mention garment and textiles and we were on our heels rather than on our toes on all of that and you know in each of those cases uh the industries got devastated and uh, some have made a little bit of a comeback, but some are virtually all gone from the United States. And we're escalating the importance of this because the auto sector in the United States is so central to so many different kinds of manufacturing that it affects not only those big Ford or Chevy plants somewhere, or even the, the Honda or Kia plants uh, down south, but it affects our tire makers, our glass makers, our flat glass makers in particular. You know, steel, probably some steel mills, 30, 40, 50% of their output goes into the auto sector. So it would impact that. So you, it would have a ripple effect across so many, even semiconductors, so many different kinds of manufacturing industries that the effect would be compounded and what exactly are we talking about? We're talking about companies that most people haven't heard heard of, like uh, BYD or NEO. Um, but these are massive brands. BYD just passed Tesla as the largest EV manufacturer in the world. Uh, China supplanted Japan as the largest car exporter in the world. So there is an enormous reason to be concerned about what could happen if we don't get our policy right, even if these t- vehicles today aren't coming directly from China. Rick, as you indicated, you know these companies are looking at workarounds, uh, and and Mexico uh, seems to be uh, their entry point. Yeah, right well, now, where they, where the, they the tariff, as I understand, is twenty five percent coming in from China. But if they find other places like Mexico, that that's you know, limited, right? I mean, we have a free yeah. trade agreement with Mexico, obviously. It'd be so, zero. That's right. So it'd be zero. Yeah. But don't we have some kind of language that says, you know, there has to be some kind of content uh, number as part of that to get that zero? Is there is there uh, is there nothing in that agreement to protect from doing what China is going to try and do? That that's a good question, and the answer is there is. There is a uh, there's both kind of like a uh, wage standard. For part of it, um, there is a content threshold uh, that's sixty-five percent. But a lot of the Chinese parts makers are also locating uh, their production in in China. I, I mean, sorry, in Mexico. So they and and the battery. If the batteries are made in Mexico, they they will be able to meet a lot of the content requirements because that's the biggest value for these EVs, right? And, and even with that, you know, that, that gives you a 0% tariff coming in to the U.S. market um, without, even if it doesn't qualify for, for that treatment, for that USMCA zero tariff treatment, the tariff's still really low. It's 2.5%. Wow. So that's not much of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a 90% so, slashing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is some advantage to doing, to having those content standards, but it's not, you know, it's not extraordinary. So yeah. Um, it, it's better than nothing, and so yeah. there's a uh, there, there's there, there are big reasons to concerns, and that's why, you know, Elon Musk, uh, you know, Ford, some of these other companies are are starting to say, hey, uh, we we ought to pay attention. 
Uh, no, what's interesting is, you know, I heard Musk talk about this, uh, you know, saying that, you know, the, the, the cars are actually pretty good. They're actually really yeah. good because uh, when I think of, you know, something coming from China, especially a car that I'm going to potentially drive in, my first inclination is, I don't know. I don't want the wheels falling off while I'm dri- going 60 miles an hour. I don't want the doors falling off. I don't want what I've seen in other products, you know, to be you yeah. know, what I'm driving in down the highway with my family. I, my first inclination is eh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass. But when you've got Musk saying, you know, these are these are really good. And when you've got him worried that it could take over the industry, that that sends a different message. It does. And, and look, here's the truth. It, it was the case where 10, 20 years ago, the cars that these companies were making uh, were not fit for American roads. OK, I mean, they they were they were junk. They were I mean, an American consumer who would jump in one of these would be like, no, there's no way I'm going to drive this. But uh, in part because of technology transfer, joint ventures, a lot of subsidies, uh, you know, a lot of uh, intellectual property uh, that might have been lifted. Um, you know, because all these Western companies have operations in China, uh, you know, Volkswagen, you know, Ford, uh, GM, uh, uh, lots of other big players are there. You know, the, these companies gain know-how um, and they got better and they had a captive market. And so, you know, just a few years ago, the Western brands were out selling the Chinese brands in China, but that's no longer the case. And you know these companies are offering a wide range of automobiles, um, and they are they're they're pretty competitive from a feature and a performance point of view. With uh, and and they're all EV, by the way, the, right. those cars that I mentioned, like the BYDs and what have you. And so so they they in some ways they have they've had a head start at, at mass production over what we've been able to do. And so yeah, there is reason to be. I mean, look, there aren't dealerships yet. You know, there's no BYD dealerships. Uh, they have, they do have to make, meet U.S. Uh, you know highway traffic safety standards. So there's a lot of hurdles, but um, they're inching closer. And once they get over that, then it's like, look out. Yeah, because... then the floodgates open. No, I, I, yeah. I get you on this. And the, the, the other part of this is something you guys talked about as well, I think, is the fact that this is the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, they heavily subsidize this. So even if they're building in Mexico, uh, they're heavily subsidizing that so they can keep the prices artificially low. Uh, that would then wipe out the competition and not just the, the, the U.S. big three, but across the globe, because they're not only trying to you know, go through Mexico. They're also looking at, I think it was pointed out, uh, Hungary and uh, yeah. and and Thailand as well as they're trying to, to produce vehicles. Again, subsidizing them heavily and, and you know, basically destroying what what competition would be there so using the communist model in a capitalist system um yeah that that's scary yeah yeah that that's exactly where they're and, and, and you know what Th- this is something that the chinese communist party and the companies that it is supported in china have been very good at is like building up using western technology using incredibly low wages having a captive market at home and then selling at a loss overseas to wipe out the competition and coming in and gaining all the market share. And, and we've seen this in industry after industry. I've seen so this movie. It's, not, it's not like it's a new playbook. It is their playbook. And uh, the, the difference is, you know, we haven't responded to it in any effective way in the past. And our report lays out, you know, 11 policy recommendations, and there could have been 50, by the way, but but we distilled it down to 11 that policymakers can take so that this doesn't become a problem where we need to do cleanup duty and take care of auto workers who have lost their jobs or communities that have been devastated and all the supply chain jobs that would be at risk too. Uh, there is time to do something about it, yeah. but we're, you know, we're, we're, we're not... We're, we're not too far off from and this a, being, you know, visible. And, and a quick side note, we have no trade adjustment assistance anymore. So even those yeah. workers who would, could lose their jobs potentially from, from you know, Chinese vehicles coming in and wiping out an industry, there's nothing there now. Uh, Republicans in Congress made sure that that died. Uh, so there is no trade adjustment assistance in place. But you, you talk about also 
uh, about the supply chains and how you know the battery uh, technology being completely controlled by the the Chinese, basically the Chinese Communist government. I'm not going to say that there's yeah. any difference really between the companies and them. Um, I was listening to, or was reading a story with Jim Farley, the guy from Ford, you know, kind of yeah. talking about wanting to to recreate what they already had, which is they controlled their own destiny. They had their own parts. They had their own manufacturing. They had all this stuff. They gave it away. So what do you say to the person who goes, I, I don't have much sympathy for them because they gave away their technology by teaming up with these Chinese companies where they couldn't own their own technology. They had to turn this stuff over to get into that market. So basically they gave away whatever leverage and power they once had for, for short-term profits. What do you say to that argument? Yeah. Look, it is a good argument. And I agree with, with a lot of it. I, I, I don't disagree. I think that these companies went in. I do think some of them went into China with the intention of trying to sell on the Chinese market and saying, we've got a billion consumers here. Let's let's sell some cars, even if the middle class is, is small, it's going to grow and, and they're going to buy cars. So we should be there. I get that. And these companies largely do not uh, send their their these cars back to the United States. There's a few models that do come back from China, Rick, but but there's not there's not many at all. Um, and so I d look, but but they had to know pretty early on that they were getting ripped off. I mean, there's no, 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 I agree. But you know, but, yeah. what, what I'm talking about is supply chain. I mean, you cannot, yeah. you almost cannot find replacement auto parts for cars that are made in the U.S. anymore. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and for yeah, me, that, that's, that's exactly a huge right. part of of yeah. what they control. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. gave that away. Yeah. And, and you're right. The companies were like, well, let's focus on our core competencies, right? And let's spin off all these parts makers and then venture capital or private equity would buy them. And they'd say, you know what, we're going to make a lot more money if we close down the factories in the United States and open them up in China, Mexico, wherever else. Um, and, and that's, yeah. And that's a lot of what happened. So, uh, so the supply chain uh, is very global very global um, for all of that. Yeah. And so getting that back, I mean, the irony for Ford, you mentioned Ford, Rick, Ford is using now Chinese technology for a type of battery that it wants to put in EVs because it was, it was developed by a, basically a state owned company <laughs> in China. And now you're like, Oh, you grew up, you basically grew up Frankenstein company. And now you're going to have to buy this technology back from them. Um, and it's a, it does have you shaking your head. And, and you're right, I, I'm not we didn't write this report. We're not issuing these policy recommendations out of any deep well of empathy for these big, huge companies. OK, but it is about the workers who work hard, who make a good product. And by the way, yeah. who, who turn profits for their companies consistently uh, in the United States. And these workers do deserve a better fate. And so that's that's whose back we have to have. And also just the implications that it has for other things, even if you're not in the autos. People live in these communities other than auto workers, and they're going to be devastated as well. Our national security depends on having the know-how of tool and die makers, of parts makers, of these engine makers around, because that goes into military vehicles as well. And if we lose that, we're in big trouble as well. So there are a lot of reasons to care about this, even if you are not an auto worker, or even if you do not have a well of sympathy for the decisions that some of these CEOs made. Uh, and so, but but there, there's a lot of really good solid reasons why we ought to be concerned about this no. and do something about I'm it. I'm right there with you. Also, just having the physical infrastructure uh, in the event that you ever needed to turn on a dime and increase uh, war production if you had to. Uh, sadly, right. we, I don't think we have that product production. Uh, I hope lawmakers will look at this. I hope that they will, in a bipartisan, nonpartisan way, uh, move on this because I think we're already behind the eight ball. Uh, but I'm hoping something something comes out. Uh, before I let you go, I got to ask you, you were just in my hometown of Cleveland uh, for yeah. the premiere of a new documentary film titled Relighting the Flame um, about you know the Cleveland Cliffs 
uh, steel mill there and the workers and and what that what that what that success story has been. Uh, tell me about it. Yeah. So, well, Rick, you know, Cleveland and anybody who's driven into Cleveland, you can't miss the steel mill. I mean, it, it's like it's downtown, basically, or just a, a mile or two from downtown. Just under the bridge. And yeah, yeah, that's right. And and it was, um, you know, it, it has been through turmoil and downsizing from the 1970s to going bankrupt uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Some people thought it would never open again. And uh, it did. It's gone through a couple of ownership changes. And now they can't hire enough workers there, you know. And, and there's a there's a you know, there's like a, 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 a gas off flame that's visible. And and when that flame was out, you know, I, I think the, a lot of the community felt devastated in Cleveland and, and it's it's relit. And so that's kind of what this is about. But it tells the story not through policy or anything like that the stories of workers who are coming into this mill uh, and not only in Cleveland, but also in Northwest Indiana uh, and, and down in uh, Southwestern Ohio as well, but just what these jobs mean to the community. And, and it's, it's great both to step inside a steel mill and see it because most people don't have that opportunity and it is otherworldly what happens there, the combination of heat and high tech and, and what that forms. And just what what it also means uh, for 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 all of these families, and so we want to keep it strong. We wanted to get the story out, relighting the flame, uh, and, and it's available now for anybody to look at if they go to relightingthefilm.com. You can look at it. it's a 27 minute documentary by an award winning documentarian from Cleveland. And and we hope everybody gets to take a look at it. No, it, it's great stuff. And you know, for me, the and, and taking a look at it, that frame that I grew up with as an eight year old, uh, when I saw the neighbor get the job at Ford, uh, and and that frame of union job, better life, just just comes through in this. Uh, and I hope I hope yeah. folks will take a look at it because it is it is an important it is an important story. Uh, and, and an important frame of mind that, you know, those jobs, uh, the, they, those union jobs, those are good jobs, family sustaining wage jobs with with retirement and health security. Uh, it's good stuff. Yeah, you nailed it, Rick. That's exactly right. Thank you. Scott, as always, I appreciate the good the good, the good news uh, and the, the battle cry. Uh, we got a lot of work to do. But Scott Paul, president of the Alliance for American Manufacturing, appreciate the time. Rick, it's great to be with you as always. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. I want to hear your thoughts. Should should we should we swing the door open? Free markets, right? Get those cheap EVs because the consumers could could benefit. I've heard that argument. Uh, but if you don't have a job, there are no jobs around. It doesn't matter how cheap it is. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, Rick at the Ricksmithshow.com. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I got a kick out of this video that I saw on social media. Uh, it It's a video of Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. And he's talking about Donald Trump. And this is one of the things that I've said for a while about Trump, that this, uh, my problem with him is is with, with Putin. And, and the fact that with a lot of the authoritarian types, uh, he seems enamored by them. He seems like you know, hey, th- these are my these are my peeps. These are these are who I want to be. So on this talk show, you, you you have this Australian prime minister, prime minister going after Trump, you know, saying, hey, you know, he, um, what was the the phrase? Um, he's like a twelve year old boy that goes to high school and meets the captain of the football team, my hero. He said it's really creepy, um, and and. That is a really good description. In fact, you know, I, I want to play. Uh, I want to play the the prime minister uh, and his comments because, uh, again, it's one of those things where the guy is so spot on. Uh, here's the Australian prime prime minister, uh, Malcolm Turnbull. When you see Trump with Putin, as I have on a few occasions, he's like the twelve year old boy that goes to high school and meets the captain of the football team. (laughs) Uh, My hero, it is really creepy. 
It's really creepy. No, and I don't... that struck you at the time? Oh, absolutely. It struck everybody. It was, it was like it, you could touch it. It was creepy. The creepiness was palpable. Are you trying to say they're having now, a bromance? No, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying... I'm just telling you what I saw. Regrettably, the Republican Party under Donald Trump and particularly the right wing of the Republican Party are very sympathetic to Vladimir Putin. I mean, I've been with Trump and Putin. Uh, Trump is in awe of Putin. Tyrants are often popular. You see, the key to democracy, liberal democracy, is that it empowers the majority, but it also, through the rule of law, constrains the majority. And if you get to the point where anybody who can muster a majority, and I don't think Trump can do that, by the way, but anyone who can muster a majority is given absolute power and then can do whatever they like to the minority, that's not a democracy. That is a tyranny. That, that, is, that is an autocracy. Even if it's got the support of 50, 51% of the population, that is not what makes a democracy. A democracy, as we understand it, is one where the rule of law protects all citizens and the rule of law applies to all citizens, whether they're the president or the prime minister or an ordinary, uh, uh, you know, elector. I got to tell you, that is one of the best uh, descriptors that I've heard in a very long time. And the fact that he goes into what, what democracy is, because I've been saying, look, I believe that this election comes down to, and we can talk policy, and I'm I, I, where I want to get to, but I think, you know, this this election more than any is, do you believe in democracy or do you not? Uh, do you believe in, you know, liberal democracy of, you know, self-governance or rule of we the people uh, and not mob rule? And he, he's, he's very articulate about that. You know, just because you've got the majority of people on your side doesn't mean you get to have mob rule, that there's laws in place to protect individuals. And there are and should be. Now, the other side of this is the idea that, and this is where the Republicans, you know, a lot of folks that I know are, are pushing for, you know, if we win, we're going to impose our will. And our will will be that that crushes, go down the list of, 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 of things. Um, you know, we're going to make, we're going to make, you know, fertilized eggs babies now. Um, and then we're going to impose our, our theocratic will, our authoritarian will on, well, Everyone, whether you believe or not. Now, I've made this argument numerous times over the years, and I always have someone throw back at me, well, you're a union guy and you want to have unions rule. No, no, I want to balance. Uh, I want workers to be able to, in their workplace, if a majority say we, we want to have a union, they get a union and they negotiate. Now, you know, this is where this, this, is where this gets in that space. You don't have to join a union in those places, but you do have to pay for the what you get. And this is always that, that moment where you go, look, even in a democracy, when George Bush was doing things in the Middle East that I didn't agree with, still had to pay my taxes, still had to pay to, for my price of admission to be a citizen. I see the same thing in the workplace. If you're getting the benefits of wages, hours, conditions, and representation, you should have to pay for those. Now, you don't have to be a card-carrying member of the union. You can say, I'm, I'm not. But the benefits that you get, you should have to pay for. That's the, that's, that's the part where people, some of my, my right-wing friends seem to lose their minds. And, and look, this is where they lose their minds in that, well, if I don't get everything I want, and look, this isn't just the right, this is, this is both sides. If I don't get everything the way I want it, how I want it, when I want it, where I want it, I'm taking my ball and going home. I'm going to leave the country. And I've never said that. Uh, if there are things that happen that I don't like, I'm a firm believer in that you organize. Uh, you go out and you get more people to agree with you in a democracy. And then you go and you change the things you don't like. Now, you, you don't get to crush the minority which is where some of the authority, or authoritative tendencies of the Trump world, they can't wait. They can't wait to put women back in the, in the kitchens and you know blacks back in the fields and gays back in the closet. Can't wait. And it's in their rhetoric. If you watched any of the CPAC thing over the weekend, 
uh, that was that was frightening because that used to be stuff that you know was 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 quietly said. It wasn't something that they shouted from the front, from the stage and endorsed with what was one of the more look. I've I've always viewed CPAC as one of the the, the places. Now again, this is going back a couple of years as one of the places for conservative thought, uh, the intelligentsia, the the you know the the, the heartbeat of the, uh, the the state policy network. You know their outreach arm, and now it seems like well, crazy seems to rule the day. But we're in a moment, and, and and I look at this this statement by the Prime Minister of Australia, where the rest of the world is looking at us going, what are you doing? Uh, you are the shining city on the hill. You are the beacon of freedom. You are the place that people around the globe look to, to want to, to emulate, want to come here to this country. What are you doing pursuing someone who is telling us? He is going to be a dictator. You know, I had my daughter call me today and tell me, ask me what I thought of, you know, certain things. And, and I said, look, you know, at the end of this, I believe it's about, do you believe in democracy or not? Do you believe in the women's rights to choose? Do you believe in, in individual rights not to be trampled by, by someone whose feelings are hurt? And, you know, for me, I would love to argue about policy. I would love to argue about, hey, how, what's the most efficient way to ensure that we can end hunger in this country? How can we end childhood poverty? How can we make sure that education is something that's well-funded and gives everyone the opportunity to, to live the lives that they dream of? But here we are fighting over just the fundamental, basic building block of our, of our nation, which is do we believe in democracy or not? And I'll tell you, that's... Uh, that's a tough one for me. That's a tough one to swallow. Because if you're not hearing this, it's because it's you're not listening. Because Trump has been very clear, very clear about what he plans to do. Now, I did find Nikki Haley's comment to be very uh, enlightening. And, and look, my thought was when I saw it, um, from your lips to God's ears, uh, Nikki Haley was quoted today saying, uh, the Democrats are salivating at the thought of it being Donald Trump. They are salivating because they know they can defeat him. Uh, they defeated him in 2018. They defeated him in 2020. They defeated him in 2022. And they know they're going to defeat him again in 2024. And I got to tell you, Nikki, I, I, <laughs> I'm so hoping you're right. I'm so hoping this happens and that, you know, it becomes apparent. Now, understand, if he loses, this is this is the <laughs> this is the prediction. If and when he loses, uh, there will be whining like you haven't ever heard before. I mean, Trump still today claims he, he won the 2020 election and not just one, but won by a lot. And I hear that echoed from his supporters who they truly have internalized. That there is no way that Donald Trump could have lost because evidently his crowds are bigger. I guess they don't understand. Most people don't go to political rallies. The vast majority don't. But hey, you know, it's what we see on the idiot box. It's what's on TV. It's what's what's constantly put in our ear. So I'm hoping Nikki Haley's right. I'm hoping that uh, there isn't a way for Trump to, to win. Because here's the thing. While if he loses, there will be some bit of chaos. And I think there will be. I think there'll be some, uh, some, you know, some spatterings of, 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 of trouble. Let's put it that way. But if he wins, and this is the part that's frightening to me, if he wins, everything that he said he's going to do, he's going to, he's going to do. All of the retribution, all of the, the the political payback, all of the Project 2025 at the Heritage Foundation of, of weaponizing government in every way, shape, or form. All of the organizing that's going on across this country because of the big moneyed interests to weaponize local government, to weaponize every facet of our of our government against us. If he becomes president, this 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 is our future. 
Uh, as already talked about on the federal level, do, Schedule F, we're going to fire every every federal employee, the ones that aren't didn't kiss the ring, and then replace them with good, loyal servants. And not servants to the public, servants to Trump. So I'm, I'm hoping she's right. I really am. I'm really hoping she's right. Uh, now, here's the other part of this. You know, we're in a moment right now where, again, I guess we're looking down the barrel of another shutdown uh, because the Republicans just can't help themselves. Uh, we're going to poison pill ourselves right into chaos. Uh, and I don't know that Mike Mike Johnson has the ability to, to do anything at this point. Uh, not that I think he wants to. But, you know, he took the job. He's now speaker. And he's being confronted, you know, by, by all sides. Because government still has to operate. And unlike, you know, Bob Good, who we talked about yesterday, who said, you know, we, we're not going to hold hands and, and, and get things done just to show we can. No. We're going to use basically our leverage to be able to hold uh, enough hostages to where, you know, we see who's it's a game of chicken. Because... Again, there's this view that Democrats cave. You go back to the uh, the George W. Bush years where Dick Cheney said, you know, the Democrats will cave on this. It's what they do because they've come to expect Democrats who don't want to burn the House down, who don't want to destroy the Constitution and don't want to destroy democracy, that for the good of the country, for the good of, of you know, the poor and the downtrodden, they generally cave. And, you know, it's always been framed to me like, well, are you, do you want to die a long, slow, painful death or a quick one? And, and we're in this spot where I don't know that the Democrats should back down ever on the, on this. At some point, we, the people have to start making some serious choices on who we put into, in, into our elected offices. And, and not because of red hat, blue hat, not because my team or that your team or any of that, but because of, of actual policy. You know, I, could, I hear people complain all the time about things not getting done. You know, we don't have the, the best infrastructure. We don't have the best education system. We don't have, um, you know, strong in, you know, manufacturing base anymore. You go down the list of we don't haves and then ask yourself, why don't we have them? And it's not because we can't afford it. No, we've got we've got we're the wealthiest country in the history of civilization at its wealthiest moment. It's because we don't have the priorities. Because we're still we're still eating each other over, well. Nonsense. And that's the way the wealth class likes it. I got an argument the other day over over the tax code. And, you know, the, you know, Donald Trump, you know, increased the standard deduction. So you know, we got more. And I go, yeah, but understand uh, the very well to do. They walked away, you know, basically walking, laughing themselves to their banks. Uh, while you may have gotten a few crumbs, we're adding massive amounts of debt that you seem now to care about since there's a Democrat in the White House. And we're not getting the things that we need done. Is that the world that you want to live in? And, you know, when I when I was talking to this person, they were like, the hell bent on the, you know, the Trump tax code was great. And I go, well, there were some good things. There were a lot of bad things. Depends on where you fall. Uh, if you if you were a small business owner, it was probably pretty good for you. If you have an LLC, there's a lot more that you can do. And because in in that tax code, you ended up rewarding business owners more than than workers. Uh, workers took a little dinging. Uh, they you know took away any deductions you could have had for you know work related stuff, of which I used a lot. But on the business side of things, a little more lucrative, a little more. There's some things in there you can use to make things a little bit better. So for me, it kind of evened out. Uh, I'm I'm not further ahead or further behind. I'm I, I even kind of out. But for most people. Um, they may have gotten a, a, a touch more or a touch less, but did their lives get any better? You know, did we, through our government, do the things that need to get done? And the answer, sadly, for far too many is, well, no. But the wealthy, oh, 
<laughs> the rich and powerful, they did very well. Thank you very much. It is quite, quite remarkable. I want to hear your thoughts, though. Email me, rick at thericksmithshow.com. If you've got any questions, comments, something on your mind, uh, hit me up with an email. Miss any portion of the program, grab the podcast. Gonna take a quick break right back to wrap things up. Stick around. This is The Rick Smith Show. We're working people. Come to talk. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1913. That was the day some 24,000 workers in Patterson, New Jersey, walked out of 300 silk mills and dye houses to demand the eight-hour day, better working conditions, and a return to the two-loom system. Mill owners attempted to introduce a reduction of the workforce by doubling the number of looms workers ran from two to four. Descendants of strikers recalled a 55-hour work week and children as young as nine working in the mills. The strike started started in late January at Doherty Mills and soon spread to become a general strike. Leaders from the industrial workers of the world like Big Bill Haywood, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, and Carlo Tresca organized rallies, strike support, and food pantries for the silk workers. The police routinely attacked picket lines, and as many as 1,850 workers were arrested during the course of the strike. Socialists like John Reed put on a massive public pageant at New York City's Madison Square Garden that reenacted the strike to raise strike relief funds. 35,000 turned out to hear Upton Sinclair address the strikers. Having stockpiled surplus product, manufacturers were able to outlast workers who by July were practically starving. A main cause of the strike's failure was the introduction of labor-saving technology that served to reduce the need for highly skilled workers and drive down wages. The strike may have failed in many of its demands, but silk workers were able to beat back the implementation of the four-loom system for almost a decade. They would finally win the eight-hour day in 1919. Importantly, the strike succeeded in uniting male and female workers across ethnic and craft lines. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. You're listening to the Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk. So I got to throw this out here. Uh, Tucker Carlson did that interview from from Moscow, and now coming out and saying that you know, uh, you know, he he, he feared he was going to be arrested. This, this is one of those comical, really kind of comical stories. Um, claimed his attorneys advised him that he could be arrested if he did the interview with with Vlad. Uh, Carlson said, quote, their sincere conclusion was, do not do this. A lot will depend on the questions you ask Putin. If you're seen as too nice to him, you could be arrested when you come back. What? What? Um, and this is the story. Now, again, this is this is one of those things where you go, Listen to what they're saying. They, they didn't worry about getting arrested in, in, in Russia. No, no. Uh, where they literally killed the opposition. And they've thrown reporters out of windows and, you know, stuffed them into the into the gulags and, and all of that, uh, into prison in, in Siberia. Yeah, we've done that. Uh, he wasn't worried about any of that. Evidently, he was worried that when he came back to the U.S. that we would arrest him for being nice to Vlad. Really? Oh. And the, the thing is, there are people who buy it. There are people who buy it. Also, some good news. Um, the CEO of Norfolk Southern, Alan Shaw, uh, last year, and you got to wonder, was it because of the derailment? Was it because of the massive uh, chaos that they caused that his compensation went up 37%? Um yeah, he, he got $13.4 million in total compensation in 2023, up from $9.8 million in 2022. So a 37% jump. And and it got me thinking, is this is this because of, you know, well, you did such a good job of, you know, of of, of limiting our exposure on that whole disaster thing. There's part of me that goes, that's the that's the thinking. Hey, you saved us a bunch of money by, you know, basically screwing those people over. Here's your bonus. 
Yeah. I, I, it just, it is what it is, isn't it? But is anyone worth $13.4 million a year? Any working person? And, and what does he do for that? I know he, he works hard. I'm told the CEOs work hard. Now understand the railroad workers don't have sick days. And everyone's going, well, that's Joe Biden's fault. It's not Biden's fault. It's Congress's fault. But you look at this and you just, you got, you got to shake your head. You know, as I said at the time, and for everyone who's going to send me nasty emails, go, you're defending Joe Biden. Yeah, I kind of am. But I, I'm going to beat him up here on, a, on, a, on another level. Because this was an opportunity. This was a major opportunity to unite people. And go, yeah, yeah these these. Railroad workers don't have sick days. And that, there's something wrong with that. But you know what? That home health care worker doesn't have any either. That nursing home worker doesn't. That retail clerk doesn't have one. That fast food worker. That construction worker. You Go down the list. They don't have sick time either. How about we have a movement to ensure that every working person has the ability, when they're sick, to stay home and get well and not have to worry about going broke? Maybe there's a thought, huh? That could have brought people together. How many? And I, I've asked this question before, and I've had a number of people reach out to me and, uh, and say, no, I don't have sick days. Uh, how many people don't have sick days? How many jobs are out there that don't provide paid time off? How many people are go to work every day and go, I hope I don't get sick? I hope my kids don't get sick, so, so I, I, I have to go home and get them. Because they can't lose a day's pay. How many people show up to work sick as a dog because, well, I can't afford to miss a day? Could have been an opportunity. And one I still think is there. I still think there's an opportunity for us to do to do that. Uh, also, and finally, uh, as we've been talking about for a while, the Republican assault on child labor laws. Uh, evidently, a Senate committee in Florida, uh, they've a approved a, a bill uh, that could allow employers to schedule kids you know, as, as young as 16 to work seven days in a row, up to eight hours, even when there's school the next day. Uh, according to our friends at More Perfect Union, there are some 80,000 working 16 and 17 year olds in Florida and just seven state workers who who police child labor violations. Think about that. You got 80,000 kids in, in you know, thousands of workplaces across the entire state of Florida. Massive state. Really long. Hard to get from one end to the other. And seven people, seven people to, to oversee all of that. And we wonder why there are abuses out there. We wonder. Uh, now, according to our friends at More Perfect Union, uh, HB 49 uh, passed the Florida House earlier in the month, a uh, version sent to the Senate, passed the Senate committee uh, this week. Uh, I guess it made some changes uh, requiring parental and district approval uh, to work more than 30 hours a week, I, I guess. Uh, but again, re removed a provision to let employers schedule 16 year olds till midnight. You kind of got to wonder. I, 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 I just don't see why we're loosening. Why we're loosening these, these, these restrictions. Now, evidently, the the new version uh, was backed by the Florida AFL-CIO and the Florida Education Association. Uh, but you know, here's the thing: extending hours for kids during the school year, not a. I don't think a great thing. I don't think good at all. And this idea that, because understand, the argument is we need more kids in the workforce because their parents don't want to work. Um, if you're going to overschedule these kids, do you think? <laughs> Let me think about this. Who's going to lie <laughs> uh, about breaking the law more? The teenager who's working the hours or... Or the employer. You know? 
So the question comes back to, shouldn't we be pushing for more restrictions on, on our kids going into the workforce so that they get the education that they need first and foremost, so that they have a better life going forward and not just being able to be put into the workforce and earn more money today? Or should we? Should we just tear it all down? Um, you know, have desperation in, in, in the classroom. I'm struggling with this, but the movement is there. There is a movement across this country to take us back to the good old days of the, the 80s and 90s and not the 1980s and 90s. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Miss any portion of the program, grab the podcast. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick Rick at rick at thericksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.